As the season steadily progressed, Darcy's possessive attitude with respect to Elizabeth became increasingly evident when she started to attract the attention of other men. Although Darcy strongly believed he could not have Elizabeth, he certainly did not intend that anyone else might. His constant fear was that another man would recognise her worth and steal her away from him. He knew he was being selfish and absurd, still he worried ceaselessly. By and by, Elizabeth discovered that a potential suitor had appealed to Darcy, asking if he might court her. Without speaking with Elizabeth first, Darcy had flatly told the gentleman that Elizabeth was not interested. Matthew Clennon was a handsome man, kind and amiable, and at least twelve years her senior. In appearance, he might easily be taken as a more mature likeness of Darcy himself. He owned a modest estate in Devonshire. He had called on the Darcys on several occasions and had always been engaging. Elizabeth had soon suspected he fancied her. Though she had liked him very much, she had not been attracted to him. As she was not the sort of female to torment a respectable man, she had sought not to encourage him into thinking they might be anything more than acquaintances. Upon learning of Darcy's interference, Elizabeth was so angry that she stormed into his study and demanded an explanation. Darcy confirmed her accusations that indeed he had spoken with the gentleman on her behalf. Elizabeth was livid. How dare you! You owe me an apology and your promise not to interfere in my affairs again. I owe you an apology, Darcy echoed, thinking he had done her a great service. Whatever for, might I ask? I watched Mr. Clennon and you carefully, and was persuaded you were not interested. Was I mistaken, Miss Elizabeth? Are you favourably inclined towards Mr. Clennon? No, I am not. That is not the point. The point is that I decide, not you. Miss Elizabeth, you are a young maiden living in my home and under my protection. It is honourable and expected that would-be suitors speak with me of their intentions towards both Georgiana and you. I am not your younger sister. Clearly, Darcy uttered, exasperated at having to account for his actions. First of all, Georgiana would never question him, but most importantly, he was in love with Elizabeth and spent nearly every waking hour thinking of her, <laughs> not to mention his nights. Mr. Darcy, I cannot prevent anyone from coming to you to speak of their intentions, but do not presume to speak for me. I am nearly one and twenty. I speak for myself, she insisted, now directly before his desk, tightly clutching her small fists at her side. Elizabeth stood her ground. I demand an apology and your promise to desist. Darcy loved to see Elizabeth lose her temper thus. Deciding to provoke her even more, he raised himself from his chair. Leaning forward with his hands resting on the desk, he said, I do not apologise, and I will make no such promise. Insufferable man! she furiously shouted as she spun around upon her heels and stormed from the study, slamming the door on her way out. Elizabeth was upset. She wanted desperately to rush out of the house unescorted for a long, solitary walk and a much-needed breath of fresh air. However, the last thing she desired was another confrontation with Darcy. Instead, she raced upstairs to the privacy of her apartment. She needed to think. Why must he be so controlling, overbearing and stubborn? In truth, Elizabeth was disinterested in Mr. Clennon, as well as any of the other gentlemen she had met over the past weeks. Inexplicably, every man she met she compared to Darcy. Whereas the gentlemen were amiable, sensible, and always did their best to flatter her ego, their discourses failed to stir the same passion she felt when she carried on conversations with Darcy. Though she was certain she was unaffected by him, she was sure that she desired passion in a relationship. Still, Darcy's interference infuriated her. It is understandable that he should make such decisions for Georgiana, but why is he interfering in my felicity and chances for happiness?'